Intel delays some new products. Broadcom and Marvel reported earnings. South Korea blasts Chips Act. Did we miss the dip that Tesla created? And an update on AI server sales. All this in today's episode, episode 18 of Semiconductor Investing and More, the number one semiconductor podcast in the world. Like always, I'm joined by two amazing co-hosts. First, let me introduce Nick. Nick, good morning. How's it? Everything. Uh, great. Great over here, Jose. Uh, I will try not to mention a certain semiconductor stock that you want to buy unless you give me the okay because you already bought it. <laughs> I, uh, I can't give you the okay just yet. Okay. Um, <laughs> I will I will abstain from mentioning and, its name. Nick, I, I see a new setup back there. Um, before we go any further, we're about 28 subscribers away from 1,000 in this Semiconductor podcast. I know Nick is not that far behind, so make sure to show some love to his channel as well. Let's both try to hit 1,000 within this month, uh, so that's going to be the go. Woohoo! <laughs> Second co-host here is Billy. Good morning, Billy. How's everything on your end? Good morning, Jose. Things are good. Uh, semiconductor stocks have been doing quite well this week, even in spite of uh, Jay Powell's best efforts. So, some, some weirds going on there. Uh, but we got a lot to dive into. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's a perfect segue to the first topic how every semiconductor company has been doing well, except maybe this one, the one I'm going to talk about right now. Uh, right. So, for Topic number one, guys, we're going to take a closer look at Intel. They did recently announce <laughs> they did recently announce some new GPU delays. Uh, they had a blog post, and the president of their accelerating group kind of mentioned a lot of information for their roadmap. So if we take a closer look at this first slide that I have presented here, um, on the right, I have their silicon roadmap. First, they have the CPU market, and this is where Intel is mainly known for. They just released Sapphire Rapids. I want to say these updates that I'm going to announce have nothing to do with their core products, which is the CPU market. We, we saw in their latest earnings that they still have Emerald Rapids expected to be released in the second half of 2023. Granite and Sierra expected to be released in 2024. So for their core products, no main changes. What's happening is they are seeing some changes in the GPU market. And for those that are not familiar with Intel, they just recently entered the GPU market in forms of product. Uh, they recently announced Ponte, which is their artificial intelligence and high-performance computing um, GPU. They also have a, a, a GPU for kind of visual cloud, uh, and that is their Arctic Sound, which is their Flex series, uh, for those that might be familiar. So in these changes, we can see that there was supposed to be a generation right after Ponte, and there was supposed to be a generation right after Arctic Sound. Unfortunately, Intel mentioned that, hey, they are no longer creating this. The one that's supposed to be Ante Ponte next was supposed to be Rialto Bridge, and they're skipping that one and going to jump straight to Falcon Shores. Um, Falcon Shores, for those that are not familiar, is Intel's XPU. We've heard from AMD. We've heard from Intel. They're kind of doing a mixture of CPU and GPU in one package. Uh, that's going to be, Falcon Shore was supposed to be Intel's version of that. I do want to say NVIDIA and AMD are both expected to release them, th their version at the end of this year. Um, NVIDIA has Grace Grace Hopper Super Chip, and NVIDIA has the MI300. Both are expected to be released this year. Intel, unfortunately, doesn't have anything planned until 2025 for their Falcon Shores version. And they didn't really give too much insight here. They did mention that for 2025, it's just going to be the GPU version form of it. Um, so the actual combination of GPU and CPU might not even happen till who knows, maybe 2026. Um, and it was previously thought to be released in 2024. So we are seeing some delays there. If we take a closer look at the visual cloud, they are skipping what was next sound, also known as Lancaster sound. And they're jumping straight to future sound, which is going to be Melville sound. So um, they are skipping this next iteration that they had and jumping straight to the other. I want to thank The Motley Fool for sponsoring this video and check out fool.com slash jose for the 10 best stocks to buy now. With that link, you get a promotional offer for their subscription service. Now, let's continue with today's episode. Um, I do want to say this is typical Intel being Intel. And before I kind of pass it over to you guys, 
I do want to say there might be some, at, at least a small light at the end of the tunnel here. Um, it, it, some investors might see this as a good move. The main reason Intel shifted their roadmap is because they mentioned that the products that they are skipping are only incremental improvements and over their current generation. And to be honest, their current generation isn't getting as much traction as they would have hoped. Their competitors are just beating them in that in, in, in the current market right now, especially there in the GPU front. So even an incremental incre an incremental growth in performance, I don't think would make them any more competitive, especially if their competitors are releasing newer products this year that are going to be better, far, far better. So instead, they're focusing more on significant architectural leap from the current generations in terms of performance, features, and workloads. Uh, so they're, they're jumping to the next generation and focusing on the next generations because they believe those are ones that can definitely provide some form of competitive pressure to, to AMD and NVIDIA. Um, in the final words of the blog post, the, uh, the author mentioned that they have simplified their roadmap with the goal of doing fewer things better and are rapidly rowing the, pro the products to their customers. So in, in, in my opinion, I feel like in theory, this is a good move. It's saving money on development for a product that probably wasn't going to do well for them. So instead of focusing on those products, they're using that research and development to move into those generational leaps and maybe even provide them, who knows, at an earlier time than anticipated. Um, and at the same time, Intel is not a huge player in the GPU market for, for right now. So it's not like they're going to be losing much market share. The only thing, in my opinion, is that um, it's, it's, it's going to continue to give AMD and NVIDIA free reign in this market for a few more years. Um, so obviously, the bad, but do you guys see any good in, in, in this? I'll first pass it over to Billy, uh, and then I'll pass it over to Nick. <laughs> um, no, there's no real good unless it unless this delay enables them to get this product out uh, with higher quality and more speed than it otherwise would have, but we won't know that for a couple of years. Right. Um, it's also like, you know, design and, and manufacturing is not easy. Um, so I don't know if going through the inter intermediate step would have given them, you know, learnings that they can apply to the next generation, or if it just would have been a waste of time. It seems like it's, um, seems like it's another move to conserve R&D dollars, <laughs> truthfully. Uh, and uh, I don't want to say it's like desperation, but it's like every single week there's like a new Intel cost-cutting move, which is probably warranted. But then you're like wondering, like, are they just like, is it like panic mode over there? I don't know. Um, but maybe it'll afford them time to really make this XPU chip really something really good, but we won't know that for a couple of years. So it's really hard to say whether uh, it's good or bad at this point. Yeah. Thank you for that, Billy. And I, I like something you mentioned. I feel like in when developing these new products, sometimes even though these iterations might only do a small performance gain, I do believe the team can gain a lot of information from developing that they can kind of move on to the future products. So I, I, I think that could be a huge mistake on their end where they might have missed a bug that would have focused on maybe an earlier product or a smaller product and now are going to see it in, in their big next generation product. Uh, so thank you for sharing that, Billy. Nick, any thoughts here? Yeah, it's, it's not great. Definitely not great, uh, but probably necessary. They need to. They need to. They need to tighten up. They got too big, too sprawling, too many irons in the fire, and not enough resources available to uh, to commit to all of them. So, um, I think the worst thing, though, is like like you both just mentioned, is it, it kind of allows AMD and Nvidia to to pull ahead and eat up market share at probably the wrong time, right? Like all of a sudden, this Chat GPT thing has kicked off all of this interest in, in AI and specifically in commercializing AI and um, Intel doesn't have, doesn't have some competitive pieces of the puzzle, like the behind the scenes infrastructure puzzle 
in place to address all of it, like AMD and NVIDIA do. So I think, I think it's going to be a long uphill battle for Intel for many years to come, but I don't think that's new news at this point. Yeah. Um, thank you for that, Nick. And I, I just want to say, I do think one thing that this artificial intelligence I don't know if hype or, or, or what we're seeing right now in the artificial intelligence market is definitely showing is that these semiconductor companies are are, are going to need to focus on some form of accelerator for these workloads. Uh, we know Intel definitely was in the CPU market and used to be a leader in there, uh, but we can see now them trying to enter the GPU market. And there were certain kind of talks online that maybe Intel would eventually leave the GPU market because it wouldn't it wouldn't be able to compete. Um, but it seems like this is something that they need to continue to to evolve in and in the market that maybe they're super weakened, but it's one that is needed uh, for their long-term growth potential. So it's something that investors should definitely keep a closer eye on, even though um, it's still a very, very small portion of this company's total revenue. Uh, so, so thank you for that, guys. I think we're moving on to topic number two. And I do believe for topic number two, we're going to take a closer look at some earnings, Broadcom earnings. And I believe, Billy, are, are you taking this one? I am. Uh, Broadcom just continues to deliver solid results, like quarter in and quarter out. Um, once again, surprising me with how, how strong their chip growth is in this environment. Um, revenue 8.9 billion up 16%, uh, adjusted earnings up 23%. All both of those were beats. Uh, they did guide for a deceleration in the second quarter which is not unexpected given everything we know about the slowdown in uh, data center spending. <laughs> um, they got it, but it's still 8% growth in Q2 and, um, you know, coming off basically, I don't know, more than two years of, I think, double digit growth every single quarter uh, for this company is pretty impressive given how large Broadcom is, um, again, this is not a high multiple stock. This is a low to mid teen stock that pays out a hefty dividend and share buybacks. So um, good execution there. Uh, for those who don't know, Broadcom, they're pretty diversified. They have a bunch of chips that go into the iPhone for like radio frequency and wireless charging, but their main um, their main uh, chip segment is really um, data center switching and infrastructure, and also broadband uh, and you know telcos. A lot of communications and infrastructure um, chips for switches, and um, uh, it's diversified, but it, a lot of it goes into to switches. Um, Semiconductor, and they also have uh, about a quarter of their revenue actually come from software, um, infrastructure software. So they bought a few um, infrastructure software companies over the years. Obviously, they're trying to expand that with VMware. Um, interestingly, last quarter, semiconductors were up 21% higher than uh, average. Their software was actually down 1%, but they have... Um, some, I guess it's not recurring software, like one-off software in uh, SAN storage, which is like not really core. It came from the Brocade acquisition a, a few years ago. Um, and that was down, but outside of that, they said their core software business was a solid 5% and renewal rates, net renewal rates were 119%. So software division still looks pretty healthy chugging along. Um, what was interesting is that um, you don't think of Broadcom necessarily as an AI company. You would think of that would normally be, you know, NVIDIA or um, some of the memory companies um, and AMD. But um, CEO Hock Tan mentioned that they do have chips that go into data center switches and demand for those are booming with AI. So they're a pretty small portion of revenue now. Uh, Tan expects AI switches to grow from like 200 million last year to over 800 million this year, which is, you know, more than quadrupling because um, AI accelerates the need for high performance network switching. Now, I think Broadcom made it, 
Broadcom's rep annual revenue is like in the 30 billion range. So this is very small. Um, however, it's pretty high growth rate. So even if some of their other business kind of slows down in the year ahead, I think this could kind of put a buttress under uh, some of their uh, revenue and earnings figures. Um, in addition, they have a big business in compute offload which um, is also a networking uh, switch. Obviously, as it says, it allows uh, data centers to offload compute um, tasks, you know, as needed to free up space. That's a $2 billion business, but they think it could do over 3 billion in 2023. So over 50% growth in some of these uh, verticals. Um, networking and infrastructure is still strong. Um, if you follow the cable companies at all, you know that a lot of them are building out fiber, fiber optic networks, fiber to the home, and the ones that still use cable are having to upgrade uh, Doxis coaxial cable to the latest generation to compete with fiber. Um, so that also benefits Broadcom when you have these sort of uh, CapEx wars in the cable industry. Um, if you follow any of those, so your charters, your AT&Ts, your uh, lumens, what have you. Um, and interestingly, they management also highlighted um, a new product called Bailey, which seems pretty interesting. It integrates um, the optical interconnects with a uh, next generation Tomahawk 5 switch chip. So I guess integrating the optical networking with the switching chip can double the performance of the current system with reducing system power. So that was a, a product innovation they mentioned that seemed pretty excited about. Uh, of course, everyone is, ex is waiting on the VMware acquisition and whether this will go through. Keep in mind, if it does, Broadcom will all of a sudden become primarily a chip company to essentially half chips, half software. So that would be a big deal. Um, management seemed to express confidence that it would close within this fiscal year, which ends in October. Um, now you've been probably been seeing headlines about regulators having problems and um, you know objecting to certain parameters within the deal. I think it's that um, for some VMware like server server software, I guess Broadcom also supplies chips to a lot of the hardware that runs VMware. And I guess regulators are worried that, you know, VMware will just always buy Broadcom chips and it'll limit competition. So we'll have to see what happens with that. Management seemed pretty confident that they were working with regulators and they were going to solve that and close the deal. We don't know until it happens. Um, and that is um, all I have for Broadcom. Uh, it's just a real steady, steady eddy here in uh, this chaotic um, semiconductor world. So what do you guys think? I want to thank The Motley Fool for sponsoring this video and check out fool.com slash Jose for the 10 best stocks to buy now. With that link, you get a promotional offer for their subscription service. Now, let's continue with today's episode. Nick, any thoughts here? Happy shareholder here. Uh, yeah, for, for years, company has been fantastic. Uh, I think what little interesting, what little tidbit I found actually going over their, their annual report, their 10 K from the last fiscal year. This was, this was Q1. We often refer to Broadcom as a fabulous company and it mostly is, but they actually do have two manufacturing sites, uh, and both there are three, I should say three of them. And at least one of them is a very specific manufacturing process for their wireless chips that get used by Apple. And I think that's significant. I did an article write up on that recently. Um, Hawk Tan actually mentioned on the call, someone asked about the Apple. They, it's always referred to as your biggest mobile customer on the call. We know that's Apple, as we've discussed here before. And Hawk Tan basically said, we're having excellent dialogue with, with our, with our top mobile customer. Things are going very well. It's a great relationship. So, um, between that comment and 
some little tidbits I found in the 10K about that manufacturing site. Apple Apple can't, can't just design the chip. It also needs to find a ready replacement for manufacturing the chip as well. And it may not be readily available mm-hmm. outside mm-hmm. of Broadcom. I, I tend to think that that business is a bit stickier than some media reports have been asserting it is. Uh, and, and I think overall, I think this, this Q1 report, it was just kind of another flex for Broadcom. It's a fantastic company. Thank you for that, Nick. I, I actually, I think maybe one day we should do an episode to see how the financials would look once this company combines. Because I, I, I do believe, right, this is one that's traded. Um, it's, it's more of a, compared to some of the other semiconductor stocks that we look at in this channel, um, this is a little bit more value-eyed, I want to say. Um, so I want to see if, how, how that would change once you kind, we kind of like change the... Um, the financials with VMware, and it's, it's it's interesting to hear that management is still pretty um, pretty confident that that deal will go through by the end of the year. Um, I'm I'm also super excited to see those AI products taking off. We're going to see the last presentation or the last topic in today's episode. How there's a lot of comp- a, a lot of growth in this market, and it's still fairly small. Uh, so uh, pretty excited for Broadcom investors. I'm not a holder, uh, but definitely one that definitely shows some great results. So. Thank you for that, Billy. Thank you for that, Nick. Uh, before we close off the section, Billy, any final thoughts? Um, not really. For, um, I guess, uh, somewhat defensive investors who want semiconductors, uh, we talked a lot about the analog and embedded guys, but I think I would put Broadcom up there as well. Guys who like dividends and not too much volatility. Thank you for that, uh, Billy. So I think now we can jump into topic number three and other earnings. And this is one that um, I think I think both Broadcom and Marvell are two companies that we discuss a nice amount on this channel. Uh, so Marvell just reported their quarter four earnings. Nick is going to explain to us a little bit of what's happening here. So sending it your way. <clears throat> yeah, I think in the past we've called Marvell Technology a baby Broadcom, and that's probably not completely fair. But there is some overlap in and similarities in what the companies design. So uh, I'll just run through the high level numbers here first. Uh, Marvell's quarter was good. Um, I'm going to start with the full year, full fiscal year 2023 revenue and and profit metrics first. So total revenue was up 5.9 billion, up 33 percent. Gap net loss did improve to 164 million net loss compared to 421 million last year. Free cash flow, 1.07 billion, up 69%. And the discrepancy between those two is mostly amortization of acquired intangible assets. Remember, Marvell has made multiple acquisitions in recent years to, to bolster its portfolio of chips to kind of create one of those one-stop shop type of design Houses kind of like uh, a lot of other chip companies have become, like Broadcom, like AMD and NVIDIA and so on. So mostly amortization expense from those acquisitions. So I think free cash flow is the better metric to watch at this point as a result. Uh, and I think the benefits of those acquisitions are are beginning to be seen with that big jump in free cash flow in this last year. Uh, however, as... Billy talked about last week, I think that was you, Billy, that talked about some of the weakness creeping into the data center and server market, mm-hmm. uh, specifically not so much on the cloud side, but but maybe like more of the on-premise business, the enterprise businesses. Um, so I think we all know PCs and smartphones are kind of in the trash right now. Uh, but some of that memory excess inventory is starting to creep into adjacent areas of the data center, which is hurting Marvell. So Q1 revenue is expected to decline 10% year over year. The company did reiterate what everybody else is saying. There's probably going to be a recovery the second half of calendar year 2023. But for Marvell, because of these weird inventory dynamics going on, uh, it's creating some weird product mix, product sales mix issues that are going to keep its profit margins in check for a bit longer. So I think we're probably going to see like a revenue rebound first, second half of the year, 
but not see the profits rebound until a bit later. So basically, I think the long-term thesis for this company is still good, but we're going to see a delay. Um, so jumping to the next slide here, I, I just put together, we put together this breakdown showing the dynamics going on. You can see the data center vertical, uh, significant sequential decline from the third quarter and expected decrease uh, in, in, about a mid teens percentage decrease is expected for Q1. Uh, strength in enterprise, strength in mobile carrier infrastructure. Again, kind of like what Broadcom is reporting. Um, consumer market's pretty small and insignificant, so we'll skip that. Uh, automotive and industrial, interestingly, also a 10% expected decline in the first quarter. So I, I think the takeaway here is you, basically the chip the chip downturn is is hitting Marvell. If you're a value investor, this is not for you. This is probably not a stock for you. Uh, a lot of the thesis here is that not just the company will grow long term, but profit margins will steadily improve along the way because of all those acquisitions. And we may have to wait three or four quarters to see a resumption of those profit margins. Profit margin increases come back. So. That's my take on Marvell. Uh, like I said, good quarter. Outlook, not so much. Uh, not such a great thing. Either of you guys own Marvell, or am I am I like Lone Ranger here on this one? I want to thank the Motley Fool for sponsoring this video, and check out Fool.com/Jose for the ten best stocks to buy now. With that link, you get a promotional offer for their subscription service. Now let's continue with today's episode. I think you're a Lone Ranger here, Nick, but it's one that Lone I Ranger. personally um, don't mind. This is another one, thanks to you, that I've added on my watch list. Um, do, do, Nick, do you know if after these this week guidance, did um, stock price drop? Uh, did it pull down or how, how did it stock act? It did. It, it, it sold off. I mean, it was, it was riding a pretty decent rebound, like a lot of chip stocks since October, since the bottom in October. But I think after this report, this is a bit of an underperformer compared to the chip industry overall uh, since October, at least. And I think I, I, I have not been buying in recent months. I was, I was a buyer last year, kind of depressed levels. And I think I'm keeping this one on hold again for myself for now. I think we could be in for some, some more pain or at the very best, at the very best, I think maybe some, bumpy bumpy roads ahead for Marvell stock because of the the profit margin issue going on definitely i mean looking at that free cash flow that's super amazing to see right with six uh, about 20 a little bit less than 20 percent it might seem um in, in free cash flow so pretty interesting nick can you can you just explain a little bit more on how the kind of memory side is affecting a little bit on, on their data center revenue right um they didn't give a lot of product specifics, but I think what's happening, if you think about what Marvell designs, so historically they're known for the DPU, the data processing unit, which you can think of as like a specialized CPU, but its job is to kind of coordinate the movement of data, for example, through a data center. And so if, if memory is kind of you know, down the drain right now. No one needs memory chips for the data center. Some of those ancillary pieces, like let's say a DPU, or maybe some of the chips that that uh, control switches or control the uh, transceivers or the optics that the data tra transfers to between the memory and the DPU. Uh, so those ancillary components, companies like we have plenty of memory, we're not buying memory. Maybe we also have enough of those ancillary chips too. We have enough DPUs, we have enough uh, optics control chips, photonics chips that they uh, that they acquired. So I think that's what's dragging down parts of their data center segment, um, but still some strength elsewhere in the business outside of that. It's just primarily that uh, that particular part of their portfolio that is closely related to memory. Thank you, Nick. Billy, any thoughts here on your side? Yeah, it's just, uh, it's really weird to see Broadcom's data center switching strength 
uh, alongside Marvel's weakness. Because, you know, you think switches and then you got DPUs, they're not, I don't know, I don't operate data centers, but they don't seem like they're that far off from what they do. So it was very interesting to say, I'm not even sure, do they compete with each other head on in products? I'm not even sure, Nick. I, um, I think there is some overlap, yes, but. Well, maybe maybe Broadcom is winning some of those design wins. I don't know. It's it's a it, it's perhaps not surprising to see Marvel be weak given what we've learned about the data center. It's more about um, how surprising Broadcom's strength was to me, <laughs> in spite of all this. So, um, you know, some of this maybe have to do with supply chain and if they overshipped last year uh, versus this year or not. Um, but it's definitely an interesting one. It's one I might take a look at given how beaten up it is. Um, it does look like, yeah, there are a lot of, I'm curious whenever there's a big gap between net income and free cash flow, how much is stock-based compensation, which is a real expense, and how much is amortization of intangibles, which you can probably say it's not really um, an ongoing <laughs> um, expense. It looks like most of that is amortization of intangibles here, although there is. It is, yeah. I guess there is about 500 million of stock based compensation. So, um, so yeah, maybe like real earnings last year was like 600 million, maybe. So, the thing, the thing that's kept me away from it is that it's, it's kind of an expensive stock, um, mm -hmm. just based on current earnings. So, but after this dip, you know, this weakness might be one I dig into a little bit more. Um, if you're playing a rebound, but uh, I, I just find it weird that Broadcom can be so strong and these guys can be so weak in the same quarter. Definitely, Billy. Thank you for that, Nick. Any final thoughts before we move on to the next topic? Yeah, it is. It is totally bizarre. I'm I'm with you on that, Billy, uh, because even if they don't have any competition, they're complementary businesses at the very least. All of mm -hmm. these various parts need to be scooped up um, by companies. But I think maybe at the end of the day, you could say this is why some people in the tech world kind of dislike Broadcom is they have this habit of like habitually under shipping product to customers to like make sure that they don't get, uh, you know, hurt when there's a downturn um, and it keeps margins elevated and Marvell's a bit, uh, it's a smaller company, so maybe not as robust of a, of a supply chain and sales department. They have mentioned in quarters past about being a couple of degrees separated from some of their actual end final customers. Mm. So possibly some room for improvement there for Marvell that I think, I, I, the way I like to look at it, it's room for improvement. It's a very fixable problem. So that's a, that's a bullish thing. I think for the stock, if they can fix those problems in the coming years. Um, so I think that ends with topic number three, and now we're moving on to topic number four. Billy's going to take the lead here. We're going to learn a little bit more about maybe some international markets not being too happy about the U S chips act. Uh, so sending it your way, Billy. Yeah. Um, getting to the chips acts and, uh, kind of the good and the bad if you are a uh, foreign chip maker. Um, chips Act, you know, is open to international companies building facilities in the US. So unlike uh, some of the company, some of the countries I'm about to mention, we're not looking to build national champions here. Uh, we are opening it up to the quote unquote free market for our government handouts. So that's good. However, uh, it looks like the CHIPS Act has a few more strings attached than your uh, Korean counterparts might be used to. Uh, <laughs> so um, uh, every, everyone's applying for CHIPS Act subsidies now because um, everybody wants uh, to get that money to build out capacity in the US. Um, this uh, Wall Street Journal article that I found in the last couple of days um, centered on South Korea's Samsung and SK Hynix. Um, Samsung already has uh, some foundry stuff in uh, Texas, uh, so they'll be applying. Um, 
basically the chips act so if, if if you're a chip maker and you want to get chips act subsidies there are a few uh strings attached that i guess just came up um the us is demanding that uh companies that get subsidies offer child care for employees um they're also um requiring that companies kind of open up their books and give financial projections about what their returns and profits are estimated to be from the building out of these plants. And if you kind of do wildly better than that, um, the government's going to want some of that money back, uh, which is another um, hang up that is apparently annoying some of these uh, Korean executives. Um, in addition, if you take Chips, Chips Act uh, subsidies, you cannot uh, build anything in China because we don't want our money directly or indirectly going to building out chip making in China. And both Samsung and SK Hynix already have plants in China. So not that they're going to go build a new fab, but if they want to sort of expand on their original sites, they're like, hey, wait a minute, we already have We've already got some uh, manufacturing plants over there that are that are up and running, and now we can't like efficiently efficiently expand them. You know what the hey? Um, also, in terms of giving financial projections, some of them are wary about giving too many projections, saying that that is uh, confidential business information, and they don't want to open up those books to uh, everyone. So uh, it's a lot more strings attached. Uh, I mean. Korea ha has a long history of subsidizing its own chip makers. Uh, perhaps some might perhaps say unfairly, uh, especially in the memory markets where price competition is brutal. And if you've read the book Chip War that like Nick and I have, you know the history of uh, these East Asian company uh, countries wanting to incentivize chip making. Uh, and giving generous subsidies, uh, whipping the banks in the country to give low interest loans to chip makers, uh, usually without too many strings attached. So you wanna to come to the US, you have to do more. And some of these uh, officials are not very happy about it. They're currently in discussions. I don't know, this seemed like the leak to the Wall Street Journal was almost like a bargaining. They were trying to bargain because <laughs> these um, these uh, talks are still ongoing. Uh, the Commerce Department did counter that the profit sharing provision only kicks in if profits meaningfully exceeds projected returns and they can't exceed 75% of the subsidy you got. Uh, child care requirement is part of the subsidies, they argue. Um, so you're getting money from us and we have, you know, some authority about where some of that goes and that the child care shouldn't be um, too onerous compared to the amount of money that you're getting. Uh, also, the Commerce Department said it recognizes the importance of confidential business information. We're not gonna give any real secrets away uh, and they don't want US dollars going to China. So um, this is part of the ongoing negotiations that we're gonna probably see this year as the CHIP Act subsidies get awarded and doled out. Um, obviously, you know, these East Asia, you know, Samsung and that, Samsung's particularly known for playing hardball and for being cutthroat. So you can expect them to negotiate pretty hard and complain about everything uh, along the way. Um, and the Commerce Department, obviously, we're coming from a, um, a Democratic administration that likes things like uh, companies paying for employees and um, you know a little bit more oversight and control, let's say, than perhaps the other party would require. Um, obviously the chip makers want as much money as possible with the lowest amount of conditions possible. And uh, you know the administration probably likes to say like, hey, all these employees are happy and have childcare and healthcare and are, uh, you know, not working 24 hours a day like they are in uh, South Korea and Taiwan. 
but uh, it, it, I just thought it was interesting, and these negotiations are probably far from over. I want to thank The Motley Fool for sponsoring this video and check out fool.com slash jose for the 10 best stocks to buy now. With that link, you get a promotional offer for their subscription service. Now, let's continue with today's episode. Thank you for that, Billy. I mean, I I, I think this is, a, I want to say, maybe a, a, a win to certain semi-American companies, which I feel are going to be okay with a lot of this. It seems like a lot of the, maybe some of the international companies, uh, especially in that Southeast Asia regions might kind of be hesitant due to this, um, but um, it's, it's pretty much free money. And I don't think they're, uh, I don't think the chips act is gonna, is gonna have, uh, they're going to have plenty of applications to fill. So I don't think this is going to be much impact. And I think companies that are willing to meet with these demands, which to some extent don't seem that crazy. Um, are, are, are going to continue to win here. Um, I, I wonder, Billy, have you heard anything from maybe European-based semiconductor companies? How, how are they are, are they feeling? I, I feel like Europe might be more okay. I feel like maybe they're also very, very, um, I don't know what's the proper way, but they I, I think they would be okay with things like this as well. Yeah, this article didn't specifically mention that. I, I tend to agree with you, Jose. I think Europeans are definitely more um, open to um, you know, government social programs, uh, and, um, limits on, you know, how hard you can work your workers. I mean, this is sort of why all of semiconductor manufacturing has gone to East Asia. Cause it's like, uh, you know, TSMC's, uh, chairman, Morris Chang, who's 90 years old, he, he kind of is voiced, there's a, he's been voicing skepticism around the chips act recently. It's not just a money thing. It is a money thing, but it's not just that. It's sort of like U.S. workers are used to like eight-hour workdays and uh, <laughs> you know insurance and ch perhaps childcare. And you know he's like in Taiwan, if something goes down at our at our fab at one in the morning, it's fixed by two a.m. You know, Americans they're like maybe I'll get to it the next day. So he he kind of doesn't think it's going to work as well in the U.S. But um, uh, we will we will have to see if the cultural differences between uh, Taiwan and South Korea and their insane work hours, um, if the U.S. can compete uh, while perhaps not working uh, semiconductor fab men workers into the ground. Um, but it was a cut, it's a cutthroat business, and obviously we all know. Uh, yield and margin is like very important to these companies. So we'll have to see, um, we'll have to see how this all shakes out and then what it costs to the chip designers. Cause this might all just result in increases in manufacturing costs, which if you're a chip designer is either going to hit your margins or you're going to have to raise, uh, money for the end chips, which, um, could contribute to inflation or offset Moore's law. So. Yeah, we're at the beginning of this process of reshoring stuff to the U.S. Um, this will play out over several years, and we will have to see, you know, who takes a margin hit, who raises their prices, what electronics begin to cost for the end user. Uh, these are all things that are kind of in motion now, and uh, obviously, there's going to be conflicts along the way, as we're seeing already. Thank you for that, Billy. Nick, any thoughts here? Yeah, I, I think it's the biggest sticking point is probably the China thing. Uh, like you mentioned, Jose, <laughs> some American manufacturers don't have that problem to deal with. They don't have significant manufacturing operations in China. But for the South Korean and Taiwanese counterparts, that basically could kill off what they've already built in mainland China. It'll be interesting to see that happens. Now, I'm also I'm also curious to see what happens with Europe's version of the Chips Act, which is not finalized yet. They're still working on that. I'm curious to know if if legislators over there stick similar similar stipulations on their money as well, because as we know, Europe wants to increase its share from like a single digit percentage 
share of manufacturing market right now to like 20% by 2030. And I would not be surprised to see Europe also tell Samsung, TSMC, SK Hynix, hey, you want European money, you're also going to have to play by the same rule. Uh, this makes me this makes me nervous um, <laughs> when when you like try to get you know two two major continents to try to cut China off from from capital flows. I think this this sets us down a road of unintended consequences and and unknown unknowns. But you know that's what we as humans do. <laughs> We we do these things and and we deal with the consequences later, um, so we'll we'll have to see. Um, it makes me it makes me nervous. Uh, I think maybe my last final word on this topic is this is why I prefer not the chip fabs themselves, but the manufacturing equipment companies like your ASMLs, your applied materials, and such, because the fabs are this free money that's not really free money puts businesses in a, a precarious situation, I guess I would say. So I like the fab equipment companies. Thank you for that, Nick. And I think maybe for episode 19, um, when I was looking at topics for, for today's episode, I saw there have been a few updates on maybe more regulations and how uh, a few European countries are also kind of joining um, United States and in, in, in being maybe a little bit more stricter uh, to, to that side, that part of the world. Um, so probably that'll be a nice topic we can hit next week um, for, for episode 19. So Billy, any final thoughts before we close out this topic? Uh, no, this is going to be an interesting geopolitical and business story for, well, it's always been a, a, it's been like this for decades, but it's entering a, a strange new chapter. So it'll be interesting to monitor going forward. Uh, so now, guys, for topic number five, uh, we're going to take a closer look at Tesla. Nick is going to lead the topic here. But did we miss the dip, Nick? We, <laughs> uh, it wasn't a dip. It was a blip. It was a, <laughs> it was a quirk. It was a quirk-sized blip. It was ridiculous. So yeah, this is actually maybe less about Tesla, more about uh, maybe some of those European manufacturers we just kind of alluded to. So as we mentioned on last week's episode, Tesla Investor Day, they said that they were reducing their use of silicon carbide parts in some of their new designs by 75%, reducing the use of silicon carbide by 75%. And so there was this brief blip in some of the silicon carbide stocks. Uh, I put this um, really beautiful, easy to read chart together for you to uh, take a look at here. <laughs> um, that was sar sarcasm, but you, you can see the blip there on March 2nd from most of the companies, not all of them, um, on semi wolf speed and air test systems being the US companies involved with silicon carbide on semi in particular has been investing uh, some money in this. Uh, but then over in Europe, that's really where most of the silicon carbide uh, manufacturing is, is taking place at this point, including it, it on. I'll get to that in just a, a moment here. But ST Micro is actually the company that's been supplying Tesla with some silicon carbide. Um, they're fine since, since the brief little blip. Rome, um, Infineon, Infineon uh, being Europe's largest IDM uh, integrated device manufacturer, all of them are kind of dabbling in silicon carbide. So I guess I, w I wanted to like do this follow-up to Tesla's killing the SIC market because they didn't really kill it because most of these companies are just initially investing in silicon carbide. It's a very small market. It's an emerging growth market. And I think this is a key lesson for any investor that is investing in an emerging growth market. That word emerging is a key term there. This isn't a growth market, market, an established growth market. It's an emerging one. It is always going to be above average volatile. And I think anyone who's been investing in silicon carbide with the exception of maybe the Wolf Speed investors out there, 
uh, betting on massive up and to the right uninterrupted growth in SIC got a bit of a bailout here. And it's because all of these companies are not actual silicon carbide pure plays. On the contrary, most of what they do is has nothing to do with silicon carbide. Um, by 2027, this is expected to be like merely a five to seven billion a year market. Very, very small. Um, and I think it's also notable that Tesla's silicon carbide design, uh, inverter design that debuted in 2018 in the Model 3 was actually an in-house design from Tesla. ST Micro, which is a Swiss Italian company, kind of just manufactured it for them and, and supplied it. And now, now that they kind of have that under their belt, they've been investing these billions in CapEx to bolster their silicon carbide manufacturing. But as, as we all know here and have talked about so many times, <clears throat> this doesn't just ramp up to production overnight. Building a new fab, especially in an emerging market like this, takes years. A lot of money. It takes years to do. Um, so lots of CapEx. We're still very, very early stages of the silicon carbide market. That's why Tesla did not actually kill these stocks. They're not actual pure plays. Uh, on also investing in a new um, a bull production in New Hampshire, also uh, polished wafers in uh, Chechia and Czech Republic in, in Europe. Wolf Speed, even Wolf Speed, not a pure play. Actually, most of the bulk of their revenue comes from GAN, gallium nitride. They've done a fantastic job marketing that they're a silicon carbide pure play, but they're not a silicon carbide pure play. They're also just trying to get into this emerging market. So um, I dropped a, a note here, air test systems, which I, I really, really, I, I like this company, not just because they've made me some money, but I like the CEO. He's, he can be very candid. Um, and I think balanced in the, in, in his presentation. So I just dropped a link here to their commentary on Tesla. I think it's a great reality check. Uh, on what Tesla said and clarifying what Tesla said, because it was maybe not intentionally misleading, but most definitely misunderstood. Um, so uh, enough said about that. What do you guys think? Silicon carbide, hype, or the real deal? You investing in this, um, maintaining patience and vigilance here before making any buys what what are you what are you saying i want to thank the motley fool for sponsoring this video and check out fool.com slash jose for the 10 best stocks to buy now with that link you get a promotional offer for their subscription service now let's continue with today's episode yeah i'm definitely interested in the sector um um it's a little bit difficult to i don't think i have any pure play silicon carbide uh stuff because a lot of the stuff has gotten a little bit expensive and as you said um it's in the early early stages which means we don't know the winners necessarily yet um the equipment stock might be the way to go with air test systems but that stock is kind of already taken off or it's gotten a little bit expensive for my liking um it's also a possibility that Elon Musk is not being entirely truthful or his projection may not totally pan no. out as he said that like that has occasionally happened before. Um, so obviously there was like a one day pretty severe reaction and then people kind of got regained some perspective and uh, things normalized. But uh, it's, it's definitely, Silicon Carbide is definitely gonna grow a lot this decade, we know. We just don't know necessarily who the winners are and if there's going to be some sort of industry-wide engineering uh, feat that sort of reduces the intensity needed. Um, it's an exciting, again, it's an exciting development to monitor, but we just, we're not gonna know the answer for a while, which makes winners kind of difficult to pick, I would say. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, some of these larger, more diversified companies that are currently profitable, kind of like on maybe ST Micro, you know, 
they're probably going to find a way into a portion of this market because uh, they have more financial resources. Uh, so those are probably the safer way to go. Uh, and they're a little bit diversified. And I kind of feel like more of the pure plays have gotten pretty expensive and are a little bit risky in case things don't pan out quite as as uh, as hoped. But that's my risk aversion value investor mindset kicking in here. I don't know what do you, I don't own any of these companies yet and, but they're definitely all on my radar. Thank you for that, Billy. I want to say Nick made a great point here where um, these emerging growth stocks can be very volatile and that's why it's important to kind of understand what you own. Uh, he kind of mentioned some great points how maybe to some of these companies, they are very limited to the amount of revenue they come from this market. If you are an investor of these companies and you know that, obviously you wouldn't have freaked out on that Tesla news. But if you just own these companies and just based on their silicon carbide potential uh, and you don't know how much of the true revenue it hits, then maybe you might have had some weak hands and sold off, unfortunately, uh, during that bad day. Uh, so I, it just kind of shows and reminds investors that, hey, remember to kind of do some research and understand what you own to be able to prevent certain kind of bumpiness like this. I personally don't own anything very similar to Billy, um, a market that I'm interested on. And I, I know Nick has this amazing, amazing uh, goal that he has over on his channel where he's trying to research every semiconductor company. Uh, and I know he's posting a lot of great information there on his channel. I'm trying to do the same where maybe not post a video, but just try to learn as much about all these semiconductor companies. And these are definitely uh, on the list as well. Um, so Nick, any final thoughts before we close out the, the topic? Be patient, be vigilant, be patient in this market. It's an emerging market. The only one I own is air. And I actually, I took some profit off of the table when it was in the thirties. Um, and even after this sell off, I, I think now it's like, let's see, as we're recording this. Well, I mean, it hasn't sold off that much anymore. It, it has rebounded too. It's like 33 bucks again. <laughs> um, yeah, just be patient and be vigilant. Um, you're not going to miss the boat on this. If Silicon Carbide does take off, I think about the only pure play out there is actually, in fact, air test systems. That's about the closest you'll find to a pure, a pure play, actually true pure play. It is expensive for the time being. If you expect these ridiculous growth figures to transpire over the next decade. It's actually probably not expensive, but you have to maintain the, the, the reality is that like we're talking about a decade's worth of growth. You can't factor for all of that growth upfront. So just be patient. There's going to be bumps in the road. There's going to be opportunities to pick this one up at, I think a much more reasonable price. So I don't know. Is that helpful? Maybe that's not helpful at all. I don't know. <laughs> it is, Nick. One, uh, one final question, though. Um, for someone who wants to learn a little bit more about this market, um, which three companies or two companies would you say, hey, these? If, if, if you look at these two or three companies, you can really understand maybe the top level of at least this market right now? What, what would you say, Nick? Oh, well, actually forget these companies and just, just go to my channel and I'll teach you everything you need to know about Silicon Carbide. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, no, I think air test systems is a fantastic resource. Uh, read, I put the link in the slide to gain Erickson's comments on Tesla investor day. And it's, it's, it's really good. It's, it's a, a well thought out, very clairvoyant explanation of what Tesla meant to say. <laughs> which is kind of, kind of funny and <laughs> comical. Um, it's good stuff. So air test systems. And I really like on and just go to like on semis front page and they have beautiful schematics of the different markets they make chips for. And you can click on it and you can click on the equipment and they'll like give you a schematic showing like what chips they make and how it helps, um, power whatever device you're looking at, be it an, an EV motor or a battery system that's attached to a solar array or whatever. So I think those two companies, those are my two favorite. I don't own On, but I do not own Air. 
And I think both are have been a fantastic resource to learn about silicon carbide. Thank you for that, Nick. Thank you for that, Billy. So I think we can join that we can move on to the last topic of today's episode. And this is taking a closer look at AI servers and how and what type of growth they're gonna see in the upcoming years. Um, so here, if we take a closer look at the first slide, um, we can see I got this information from TrendForce, a lot of great free information there for, for any investor that just wants to look at different markets. Uh, this is a recent article that came out on March 8th of 2023. So was, is that yesterday? Yep, that was yesterday. Uh, so they talk a little bit about shipments of AI servers and how they will climb at a compounded annual growth rate of 10.8% from 2022 to 2026 based on their reports. Uh, so they do mention that this strong growth is expected for the next few years, driven by a lot of the technology that we're seeing here, artificial autonomous vehicles, autonomous robotics, or artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence of things, and edge computing. Uh, so those are some of the driving markets. Also, uh, as I talk about this topic, guys, at the end, I'm gonna ask you maybe what's one company that you might see benefiting a lot from from this growth that we're seeing right now in AI servers. Trendforce also does uh, give us a lot of information. First, they define what are AI servers. And AR servers are usually high-performance computing servers that come equipped with the general processing GPU. And they do mention that at the moment, I was surprised by this, it only accounted for 1% of total servers shipped uh, globally. Uh, so I, I thought that was pretty interesting um, to, to note that. Uh, they do also mention that, well, for the for the next few years, they expend a 10.8 compounded annual growth rate, that for 2023, they expect a growth of roughly 8% um, due to the overall kind of macroeconomic headwinds that we're seeing, but it's being fueled by things like generative AI and also AI search, like Google with their BARD, BARD system. We have Microsoft with their AI AI chat GPT. And they also mentioned that in China, they, um, Baidu, the Google, many call it the Google of China, um, is also releasing uh, their own or has released on February their own kind of AI search engine uh, platform as well. Uh, so those are the biggest drivers for this year. Uh, some other interesting notes is they did break down who accounted for the total annual procurement of AI servers. 66.2% of 2022 came from North America cloud server providers. Um, and, and it was pretty much the top four. It was uh, Microsoft, Google. I was actually surprised that Meta came in third place and AWS came in fourth place. Um, uh, it, it, Meta has a lot of money to spend, it seems. Uh, so pretty interesting there. Um, the other thing is it, most, the other portion came from mainly from China, ByteDance, the owner of TikTok, is was the fifth player um, with roughly eight percent, but nowhere near, nowhere near, uh, nowhere near the last in the United States. Uh, and then they have their big players over there, like Alibaba, Baidu, and Tencent. And then the other markets make up roughly twenty-two percent. Outside of that, they also did some market share for server GPUs. Nvidia makes up roughly eighty percent of the totals um, from from the twenty twenty two sales. AMD, uh, so Nvidia has the A one hundred for their North America cloud service providers. They have the H one hundred, and unfortunately, I, I don't know if unfortunately, um, due to certain regulations for China, they have the A eight hundred which they're shipping to their uh, to the Chinese counterparts uh, of some of these cloud server providers. Uh, AMD, they have the MI200 and the MI250, I believe it's called, uh, and they make up about 20% of the market share. They do mention that another huge winner here is something that I believe Billy mentioned, I don't know if last episode or two episodes ago, um, but the high bandwidth memory um, is also a huge winner uh, thanks, to, thanks to this. Uh, so... Before I take a closer look at some of the questions I have, any thoughts here? I'll start off with Nick here. I want to thank The Motley Fool for sponsoring this video and check out fool.com slash Jose for the 10 best stocks to buy now. With that link, you get a promotional offer for their subscription service. Now, let's continue with today's episode. Uh, thanks for bringing this TrendForce article to our attention, Jose. This is um, intriguing. I, I'm actually reminded of, um, I would say, an understatement that you made 
a number of weeks ago, Jose, you said Meta has a very strong engineering team or something to that effect, mm -hmm. referring to their data center design engineering, like actual hard asset infrastructure. Um, it never ceases to amaze me how many investors don't understand Meta's business. And it's not just a social media company. Obviously, they monetize using social media advertising. But the amount of infrastructure investment the company has made, um, you can make an argument it's a public cloud provider, just a very different looking one. Um, if you've done any sort of travel into emerging markets, um, the world kind of runs on Meta's apps. And I'm not talking about like peer-to-peer -peer interactions either, like business to consumer interaction happens a lot on WhatsApp, on, on Instagram, um, on Facebook marketplace. And a lot of those ads are not like big corporations running ads. They're, they're small businesses. That's the bulk of, of Meta's business is like small business ads or like a, a merchant, like, or a mom and pop shop. <clears throat> Meta purchasing or expected to purchase all of this AI server hardware for their data centers is not so surprising to me. I think they could be a huge beneficiary of this AI movement. Um, I think the slight pivot away from the metaverse towards, towards this, towards this market, um, I think Zuckerberg, there was like an announcement they created a, a new unit dedicated to generative AI. Uh, I think Meta is kind of like this sleeper company in, in the AI market. And if you can kind of remove what you think you know about Meta based on like maybe your North American experience, uh, there's like a whole world out there that runs on Meta's apps. And I, I think the company could be a huge winner from this movement. Definitely, Nick. And I, I want to say for any kind of tech enthusiast, Meta has this nice <clears throat> blog, um, AI Meta, I believe it's called, or AI or, or Meta Tech. Um, just Google that and it'll give you a great blog. And they share kind of all the great technology that they're kind of um, innovating in the future. So it kind of get, helps you kind of change that perspective uh, of how the company does. Uh, Billy, any thoughts here? It doesn't have to be per, uh, precisely on Meta. It could just be on anything else that I kind of shared um, from this TrendForce article. Yeah, I actually had a few more things to say about Meta. So, <laughs> um, <clears throat> we this AI, yeah, this, this this AI invest, this big AI investment has been going on for some time. And if you've been using Facebook or Instagram in the last year, you've probably noticed a lot of changes from newsfeed to lots and lots of reels and stuff that you're interested in. That is a big change in pivoting to reels to fend off TikTok, And I think that's why you also see ByteDance up there as the largest in China, by the way. The recommendation for uh, reels for stuff you're interested in is it takes a massive amount of artificial intelligence um, to feed you the reels that you're interested in and what you like. And I know it's paying off because my dad who is completely Facebook and Instagram phobic and said he would never go on these things is like sending me three reels a day about <laughs> comedy or golf. So it's obviously working uh, if you can lure him in, which is crazy. Uh, There's also an interesting um, Financial Times article uh, recently about um, some of the advertiser tools that are now AI driven. Um, and Meta, as you know, Apple iOS, they have new privacy controls. Meta couldn't target its ads as precisely uh, for iOS users. And Mark Zuckerberg said there was a $10 billion headwind. Uh, so how is Meta going to get its um, targeting back, its ad efficiency back? The answer is AI. And they have a new program called Advantage Plus, where they will actually take an advertiser's ad change the text and the image and iterate, do like 50 or something different iterations, send the ad out in like a small test, get data back about which is the most effective, and then blast the most effective ad out to uh, on a wide scale. And the returns from that are apparently approaching what the ad, the, the ad efficiency is apparently approaching what it was before the iOS changes. Now, if you're an advertiser, you have to hand over control of your ad to this 
artificial intelligence computer, which is a little weird, but apparently um, it's working. And uh, I wrote an article about that on Motley Fool a little while back. Um, but it's just another, so AI is infusing every single part of Meta's business and they don't use a public cloud like just about every other company, they build it all internally. So it's not surprising that they are, given their scale, that they are up there with uh, the cloud service providers. Thank you for that, Billy. Uh, so I, before we end the attempt, uh, episode, I just want to talk to you guys and kind of ask, who do you think will win or benefit from this kind of growth in AI servers? We see how it's still a very small portion is still expected to grow at, at some nice levels <laughs> on a compounded annual growth rate. Um, I obviously I had a lot of time to plan, so I, I I picked two companies. The first one's obviously going to be Nvidia. We see eighty percent of the market share in the GPU market. While AMD is very competitive, I don't see this gap getting much much. Uh, I I feel like this gap is going to stay within these levels. I don't see it shifting much uh, any direction. Uh, so I think Nvidia would be a big winner here. Uh, the second um, one that Billy brought up a, a, a few a few weeks ago, um, because this HBN market is definitely benefiting. Um, Micron is, is one of the few in the memory market that I can definitely see. I kind of took this screenshot from their Investors Day presentation, and I think it's perfect how we talked about it. How Micron. Many might have expected this to be a little bit more resilient to the current downturn because of the data center market and the graph, uh, the data center market maybe being a bigger portion of the total revenue. Uh, the company does believe by 2025, data center and graphics is expected to be roughly 42% of total revenue, while more consumer-based products like PC, mobile, and other decrease to 30 38 percent from 55 so uh, again maybe this year wasn't maybe this downturn wasn't the downturn that micron was a little bit more resilient but i do believe maybe at least for the next downturn um maybe not complete resilience but a, a, a lot more uh, a lot better than than this past one so hopefully i didn't think i, I didn't take any of your guys thoughts but i even in today's episode, we we saw a lot of companies that are focusing here in the AI market. So, Billy, any thoughts? Any thoughts on some companies that can really win um, from this AI race that you you personally are excited about? I want to thank the Motley Fool for sponsoring this video, and check out fool.com/jose for the ten best stocks to buy now. With that link, you get a promotional offer for their subscription service. Now, let's continue with today's episode. Yeah. Um... And you're right, Micron needs the help and uh, looks like they're gonna get at least a little bit of help from this. Um, well, I'm not sure if we're late to the game with this company. It's been the best performer in my portfolio over the last year. The stock has tripled uh, and it's a server company. They actually make the servers. Um, they're an assembler, it's called Super Microcomputer. And it's around a four or five billion dollar market cap um, run by its founder. It's a 30 year old company uh, was very cheap uh, for a lot of years. And these guys focus on, uh, so server assemblers don't seem like that great of a business. You know, you take all these proprietary components and you stick them together and then you sell it for like a 10 to 20% gross margin. Not that great of a business. These guys um, have found a way to differentiate themselves by uh, making super energy efficient uh, servers, uh, specifically around the heating and cooling systems. So all these chips generate lots of heat. You got to get that out. These guys apparently are the best at that. So that's a huge total cost of ownership advantage for data center operators. Secondly, these guys um, have a building block architecture. So they don't have any standard designs. They basically allow, they have an engine that allows customers to do mass customization and they are very quick to turn around. Uh, they also are based in Silicon Valley and they have very close relationships with NVIDIA, Intel, AMD, and they're often fast, very fast time to market. So uh, the CEO's name is Charles Liang. He takes $1 in salary with the rest in performance, uh, hurdles. Um, and the growth this year has just, ex the growth over the past year has just exploded for this company. I think they grew like 55% or something last quarter and earnings have gone through the roof. 
Um, stock still trades at nine times earnings because earnings have gone up so much and people think there's going to be a reversion to the mean. And there probably will be a little bit. But if the growth of AI servers really uh, kicks in, you know, that's where these guys, um, these guys, their, their financials will probably be, there's probably at least a floor under their financials and it's a non-expensive stock. So that's one that's off the radar that uh, is the rare winner in 2022 and into 2023. Thank you for that, Billy. Nick, any thoughts here? Uh, rather than bring a new one to the table, I'm just going to applaud both of you. Billy, uh, we've kind of written some articles together for quite a few years now, and you've mentioned Supermicro numerous times. You're a true value investor. You're patient. Uh, and eventually, if you find a gem, the market will figure it out and join you, and it has. So I applaud you, Jose. NVIDIA, um, it, it, it's expensive, right? Like, I'm not buying any more right now. In fact, we did a video a couple of weeks ago where I said I, I took some of my profit off the table. It's ludicrously, ludic <laughs> ludicrously expensive um, right now considering like the immediate term outlook. But I think it's just one of those companies that as obvious as it is that it's going to win, so many investors are going to sit on their hands possibly for forever and 10 years from now lament that they sat on their hands. This is probably always going to be an expensive stock because of this. This is, this is a monumental shift in computing. Chat GPT is stupid. Like it, that's not the real reason why this is a monumental shift in computing. The AI movement is real. NVIDIA is the clear cut winner, biggest beneficiary from it. Uh, you can't look at the valuation today and for the immediate term future and value the stock appropriately. You have to consider the market for it five to 10 years down the road. And as a result, it's always going to be expensive. Um, so congrats to you. I applaud you as well, Jose, for sticking with it because as obvious as it is that NVIDIA is going to win this AI race, uh, lots of investors can't can't see it. I, they just it's like Apple and and like in in like 2010 or something. Same thing. There are people that still are like, man, I could have bought Apple in 2010, but it was so expensive. <laughs> okay, it it was it was expensive, but um, the trend the trend is obvious now uh the movement is is rolling so good job both of you guys i like both of those picks <laughs> thank you nick and thank you billy as well for always showcasing some new um insight into this channel i definitely uh i i know i i can see both nick and i appreciate it uh so so thank you for that billy um so i think that's it guys for episode 18 did i say 18 was it 18 yeah, episode 18. Uh, so again, guys, thank you for the great episode. To all the viewers that stay tuned, uh, make sure to follow Billy and Nick. All the links are down below for where you can find them. Make sure to hit that subscribe button and make sure to go subscribe to Nick's channel. Let's both try to get to 1,000 subs um, and hopefully start to monetize this thing. <laughs> so take care, guys, and see you next time.